Hi, my name is Julia, and I left evangelicalism. I'm making this video for a few different reasons. First of all, I've kind of been away for the past few months, so I figured I'd update all, like, ten of you on what I've been working on <laughs> recently. Um, <laughs> unpacking religious trauma does take a lot of effort. But secondly, I wanted to share my own experiences and advice to any queer folks or any other people watching this who are curious about evangelicalism and who have also been through what I've been through, as I'm sure many of you have. I'm open to discussion, I'm open to constructive feedback, but I'm not open to being told I'm going to hell. I've been told that many times. It, quite frankly, does not faze me anymore. So if you're going to leave that in the comments, go ahead. I'm just going to ignore it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Woo! Okay, so now that we've set all those boundaries, let me give you my story. And also just a general content warning for general homophobia, religious trauma, you know, all that gut stuff. <laughs> so when I was a child, I grew up in one of Charlotte's larger mega churches. I'm not going to say it for the sake of legality, although I'm not really sure that it matters necessarily, <laughs> but just think elevation, albeit a bit more formal. It was essentially a large church that also kind of like doubled as a business and it was tax exempt, obviously. So growing up in this church, which I'll call Big Church, really shaped how I view the world as a child. Now their early years were honestly pretty fine for the most part. We were just like basically taught about God's love, Jesus' love, treating each other with kindness, which are all things I can still get behind. But in second grade, that all changed. Evangelicalism and most other Baptist denominations have this very rigid ritual called the sinner's prayer. The prayer itself originated from a certain branch of Calvinist theology and it's ingrained itself into modern evangelicalism where we see it pretty commonly today. Like I don't know if you've ever been driving on a country road but you've definitely seen a billboard like this or, or this. Yeah, these billboards are everywhere. <laughs> but the basic gist of the prayer itself goes like this. You're a fallen human by nature, and in order to escape the wrath of God, you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or else you'll be damned for all of eternity. So once you say this prayer, you're labeled as being saved by the rest of the church, and thus your new life begins. I think I speak for a lot of people when I say this, but a lot of us said a prayer at a very young age for various reasons. First of all, peer pressure. I mean, everyone else is doing it, so why not I do it? Second off, fear. I'm a seven-year-old, and I don't want to get hit by a car and then find out I'm going to hell. The rational decision in this would be to say the simple prayer. And third off, appeasement. If I say the prayer, everyone around me will be happy I did it, so why don't I do it? Poet Langston Hughes actually wrote a creative nonfiction story where he goes into this experience of being saved and how he cried because he had a lie to do it. It's a generally traumatic thing for a lot of children, myself included, but I didn't really think of it at the time. Anyway, at some point in 2012, I, Julia Hussar, became saved. Thus, my new life began. Also completely unrelated, one of my favorite releases from the past year was this record by um, um, previously Lingua Ignota, but now Kristen Michael Hader. It's called Saved, and it's like, it's a really weird hodgepodge of like a bunch of old hymns, but it's also like a critique of religion in the sense, but it's also like embracing spiritual, it's a good record. It like breaks down a lot of religious trauma, just listen to them, be prepared to, yeah, feel something. You'll feel something. <laughs> So growing up into evangelical culture, my family was ingrained in all aspects of it. For example, I listened to exclusively Christian music up until high school. I hadn't seen a rated R movie until well into my 10th grade year. I knew next to nothing about sex until like 8th grade. See, the evangelical church had become sort of an in or out club. Either you were in with the exact teachings of this fundamentalist structure, or you were out. And the main goal of this church was to attract as many people as possible to convert them into coming in to the club. And the kind of side effect of this inner out club mentality is that a certain persecution complex started to evolve in the evangelical church. Basically, a lot of ev evangelicals will think that they're being persecuted or canceled speaking the truth 
when in reality, they're just being assholes to marginalized groups. Let me know if you want a video about persecution complexes, because I honestly think that'd be a really interesting thing to talk about. So along with all of these specific things of evangelical culture, there's also kind of the social aspect of it. Our church was technically political neutral, I'm assuming for donations or monetary reasons, but everyone I knew at the church voted for Trump, called Hillary a liar, and despised Democrats with every ounce of their being. Once again, we see this pattern of an in or out club. Either you agree with everything, or you don't belong. <sighs> My camera decided to lose battery, so plan B. Woo! There was no room for discussion or debate. When I was elementary school, going into middle school, I vividly remember our pastor doing a series on Revelation. What I didn't realize at the time was this really strict interpretation that prevailed through big churches' teaching. Basically, at any moment, Jesus could return and take his followers with him into the air. Everyone on earth would be left to suffer during a seven-year period of war, famine, disease, hunger. And as a middle schooler, I bought into it because it scared the living Christ out of me. Pun not intended. I'm not even kidding. There'd be times where I didn't hear the rest of my family in my house, and I thought that the rapture had happened, and by some chance, I was just left behind. This is something I found out recently many other people growing up in evangelical culture have experienced, and that goes by the term rapture trauma, which is something I never knew existed, but definitely does exist, because I still have moments where everything's quiet, no one's picking up my calls, the rapture really just happened, oh my god. But the point being, I never knew that there were other ways to interpret Revelation, like from a historical context or from a symbolic context, because I was blindly encouraged to follow everything Big Church taught me. Instead, I would label anyone outside of my belief system as a heretic. I was truly awful in middle school for this. I was drawn to Fox News from a very young age, and obviously I just parroted whatever the anchors on Fox News said because I didn't really have the capacity or the will to think for myself until obviously high school then college, which is awesome. <laughs> the whole parroting thing is kind of how little kids are in general, but more importantly, this is how indoctrination works. You're not given space to ask questions about your beliefs. Instead, you're punished for it. So I was deeply rooted in evangelicalism during my child years and my early teenage years. While I was never baptized, I did all the things that a good Christian is supposed to do. I went to church every single Sunday. I tried to tell other people about Jesus so that they didn't go to hell and face the wrath of God. I abstained from cursing or viewing any depiction of nudity, even if it wasn't sexual in nature, because I thought that I'd be struck down by lightning were I to do something like that. But even more than that, I went to various camps and conferences where um, all the campers would basically have these so-called spirit-filled moments in the middle of worship, where we'd all feel led by the spirit to go to the front of the altar and cry, repent of all of our sins. Looking back, this is incredibly problematic for various reasons, one of them being herd mentality, something I'll also probably discuss in a future video. But the other really big issue was the way how all the youth leaders would use sexual desires, sexual urges, just like anything sex related in general, along with a myriad of other things, to essentially guilt trip students into staying tied to the faith. It was all really manipulative, and it served as a way to ensure that the students at camp would keep coming back to camp, but would also remain loyal to the church and this very particular branch of Christianity. Looking back, there are two really big things that kind of served as stepping stones for me to leave this one specific big church. So one Wednesday night, because, you know, Wednesday night was always youth group night. <laughs> Our pastor basically preached a sermon on communion with the sermon ending and all of us taking communion. But he told us, and I still remember it to this day, if we took communion and we weren't saved, we had the possibility of being stricken with some disease or some dread from heaven above. That's kind of how he phrased it. 
And obviously, as an eighth grader with undiagnosed OCD, a bunch of anxiety and depression, I was anxious. But because of all the peer pressure from everyone around who's taking it, I could not just take it. So I took it. And I spent the next three weeks wondering if I was going to get struck down by some heavenly disease from heaven above because I took communion. And I wasn't sure if I was saved. But the bigger stepping stone and the more important one that really, really like pushed me away was my ninth grade year at this church. Now, obviously going into high school, I was still like a loyal churchgoer and I didn't really give much thought to my faith. I just blindly obeyed when anyone told me because, you know, it's not going to hurt the way I live since I just stay inside the house and play video games all day anyway. Like, But in ninth grade, I was struggling with a lot of undiagnosed anxiety, depression, and OCD. My mom's initial response was to take me to the youth pastor at our church because like, hey, he's free, he's our youth pastor, we know him, why not? The thing is, he's not a licensed counselor, he's not a licensed therapist, he's not a licensed psychiatrist. If anything, he's just like an advisor. And his advice to me was to keep on praying because I'm sinful by nature, as everyone is, which means that anxiety is just a normal part of living and I should learn to pray, read the Bible, walk more with God. But then I asked him about starting meds and he really steered away from that. He wanted me to continue reading, praying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but I've been doing all of these things and I still wasn't getting better. My mental health was deteriorating rapidly. There were some things that went on, which I'm not going to go into detail here. Point being, there were some physical repercussions to this. And yeah, it really wrecked my mental health. I wasn't able to get any help from him. So in the last ditch effort, I go to a psychiatrist, see an actual therapist. Oh my god, the next two years were work for sure. But by the end of my junior year, I had kind of gotten back on track. And going into senior year, I was better than ever mentally. So I was essentially able to get out of this hole I was in because of people who generally cared about me, cared about science, and wanted me to do better mentally. In my eyes, this is what the love of Christ is. Selfless love for marginalized groups and people who are struggling and providing compassion and kindness to those who need it. Not some religious doctrine shoved down your throat because you're part of an organization whose sole goal is to keep as many people as possible inside of it. Okay, so when COVID started, I had the perfect excuse to stop going to church and it was awesome. I started reading things from a lot of different authors. I started empathizing with marginalized groups, and I even started exploring my sexuality. Unfortunately, I never quite unpacked my religious trauma, so I was struggling with something. I just couldn't put my finger on it. That being said, it was a lot easier for me to get drawn back in. Before I get into that, let's just talk about the huge elephant in the room. In middle school, I wish like all the time that I could just wake up and magically turn into a girl. I knew that was never going to happen, but, you know, I still wished for it. Obviously, I suppressed it, and it never really went away. It wasn't until senior year of high school where I seriously started to address it. I had the right people in my life and all the right resources, so I was able to start transitioning. It was definitely hard, and it still is to some extent, but I don't regret any of it because it shaped me into the person who I am today. So here's a timeline. In early 2022, I started a form of replacement therapy. That was the spring of my senior year. And at the time, I kind of felt a draw back to church in some weird way. It wasn't like, like this whole idea of the divine made man to come down to earth and battle oppressive systems, establish justice, and help teach people how to treat each other. So I started going to the small church in my town that wasn't part of the bigger denomination from the previous church I had left. To be clear, the big church I had previously left was technically non-denominational, but had really close ties with Billy Graham's associations and the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention. So it was pretty much like in the same category. It was just technically non-denominational. I don't know why, once again, probably for monetary reasons. Also, just like a word of caution to anybody who hears the name SBC, stay away from them at all costs. 
Al Mohler is a real jerk. Charlie Kirk is heavily involved with him. And if you know anything about Charlie Kirk, he's a quite literal white supremacist. So yeah, just steer clear of any SBC churches and you'll be good for the most part. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna get it into the um, small minority of non-denominational evangelical churches that aren't part of the SBC, but still have some beliefs I don't personally agree with. This smaller church was part of this other smaller denomination called the EFCA, or the Evangelical Free Church of America. And obviously I didn't really know this at the time because I wasn't looking at that. I was just looking for a smaller church to go back into, find new community, make new friends, etc. Well, initially, I thought that this was everything I wanted into a church. Everyone was pretty kind to me. There wasn't like this kind of cliqueish elitism that's common in a lot of SBC megachurches. Yeah, but at one point, eight months in, I tried to volunteer. One of the pastors, really nice guy, like friendly, amiable, takes me out for coffee, which is already kind of like, a, uh, and he has this discussion with me that I can't volunteer because of my gender orientation. And this just kind of like was the block in Jenga that you pull out to make the whole thing crumble. That devastated me like a lot. <laughs> I still remember just like straight up taking a 30 minute walk, bawling my eyes out. I'm like, oh, I'm never, I'm never gonna recover from this. There's good news in this story, I, I promise. But yeah, there was definitely a lot of hardship initially. Anyway, long story short, I find out afterwards that the EFCA does not affirm any type of queer Christian. And yeah, this, this wrecked me. <laughs> so this happened at the very beginning of this year, like at some point in January. And over the next few months, I kind of leave the church. And now I'm back in the wild, right? Like, I'm looking for a new church. What do I do? So I don't know how this happened, but I started following certain Instagram accounts and reading articles, books from certain theologians and authors. And I started to deconstruct. Deconstruction is used as a boogeyman word by a lot of pastors. But all I was doing in particular was rethinking my faith. And I just want to make this perfectly clear. If you've come from a similar background and you've deconstructed, you're atheist, agnostic, I have nothing but love for you because I understand how incredibly traumatic those experiences from within evangelical circles are and the lasting impacts that they have with us. I'm not condemning you. I'm not trying to convert you. I love you for exactly who you are. But yeah, I was not going to be part of a system that didn't recognize me as an equal image bearer of God in relation to everyone else. This church specifically was, I'm going to say, a bit more towards the center. My one issue with them, I guess, is the fact that there wasn't room for discussion again. I mean, there was, but like, you know, not as drastic as me volunteering. And once again, I'm not trying to bash anyone specifically inside of the smaller church because I generally feel that a lot of them were really well intended. It's just unfortunately, there's this inherent system and the system has rules that you can really deviate for from or else you're going to get, you know, kicked out. <laughs> so anyway, I start church hunting. I, um, I use a few websites like, um, I think it was called um, Gay Church and Church Clarity. And I went to a few smaller churches. Um, I like just kind of experimented with various um, like denominations. Um, I had a gay acquaintance back in high school who I remembered and he pointed me towards a Presbyterian church and I actually went there for a while and I liked it. I met some people um, who I'm still friends with. They were fully affirming. There were women pastors there. My only issue was um, it was in one of the wealthier parts of Charlotte, and because of that, the um, church itself was very homogenous. It was all rich white people, which, no, I, I believe in diversity in any type of community, and that wasn't necessarily a very diverse place. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I ended up finding the spiritual community at some point in the summer, 
And since then, yeah, I like knew from that moment I have found my new home. I've been learning so much, detangling my own beliefs, walking alongside other people who are undergoing similar things, leaving similar evangelical spaces. It's all been like super awesome. There is one thing I want to quickly touch on for any of you who might be looking for a different branch of Christianity. While I'm obviously very liberal slash progressive, I'd be kind of careful about progressive churches. Not that I disagree with their theology per se, and a lot of them generally have awesome people at them. It's just that I'm scared of progressive churches in the sense that like, I feel that some of them can be fundamentalist in the opposite way. Where, like, if you don't have a certain belief, they might shun you. I don't know. That just might be an irrational fear of mine. I'm just saying that there are a lot of these spaces where they have their own fixed views. And getting them to change might be a bit more difficult. I don't know. It's just some food for thought if you are looking for a new church. <sighs> okay, so that was, um, that was a lot. But if you're still here, <sighs> thanks. Oh my god, you made it so far. And... It really means a lot to me that you've decided to watch my rambling for a half an hour, my loosely scripted rambling. <laughs> now it's a fun time where I get to provide resources for anyone who's ready to start deconstructing or leave their church. Or, get this, if you're agnostic and you don't believe in God anymore, I'm not going to try to convert you because I don't believe in any of that. So, I mean this with all sincerity. You can be on your merry way if you don't want to stick around any longer because you've heard my story and anything beyond this point is just additional resources for, you know, detangling or reconstructing your faith. I want to orient this towards queer people because I know that there are queer Christians out there. It's a very small minority of us, but yeah, we exist. So as far as books go, uh, I really recommend Velvet Elvis by Rob Bell. The book itself is a bit outdated, but it kind of gives a good outline for renegotiating your faith. Um, there's also Searching for Sunday by Rachel Held Evans. Um, she's despised by a lot of evangelicals, so that should kind of tell you where she sits. Uh, Shout in the Fire by Dante Stewart is phenomenal. It like goes into this really great, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Discussion of like race and Christianity and U.S. politics. And Jesus and John Wayne by Chris and Dumez is probably one of the best histories I've read concerning evangelicalism's rise here in the United States. Like it goes into really detailed history about how masculinity, guns, politics, and Christianity all kind of coalesced into this force that's the modern Republican Party. It's a really great read. I'd recommend you check it out. If you're looking for a new church to go to and you're a queer person or an ally, I got some resources for you. <laughs> First of all, a basic tip. If they have anywhere on their website that they're affirming of queer people, like if they explicitly state that, that's always a good sign. If they don't have it, I would cautiously, very cautiously avoid it because chances are they're going to be welcoming but not affirming, which means that you'll be welcomed in the church, but you won't be able to volunteer, become a member, all that stuff. So as far as denominations go, um, Alliance of Baptists, um, Disciples of Christ, and PCUSA are affirming. Uh, don't confuse PCUSA with PCA, because PCA is like the more conservative Presbyterian side. It's that's weird. I don't know. <laughs> and there are various smaller non-denominational churches that are thrown around the United States, which are affirming. So yeah, I would definitely do research in your local area. I feel like that's honestly it. Yeah, this was awesome. It was like kind of like therapy, getting to explain myself, my beliefs. And I just want to once again say this. I love all of you, and I'm not trying to convert anyone. I don't want to convert anyone. I want there to be discussion. I want there to be openness, and I want there to be understanding between us all, because I feel like only then we'll be able to achieve some form of peace or rest. I guess if that makes sense. And yeah, I think that's it for today. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.